Today, we're going to talk about earnest money deposits, what they are, how much you should put up, why you should never lose it ever, and how to make sure that you get that money and you never lose it. Okay, so first thing, what is an earnest money deposit? An earnest money deposit is what's called consideration. So it's a form of consideration which basically tells the seller you are serious about moving forward with this offer. You're putting up some money that could be at jeopardy depending upon if you don't live up to the commitments that you make in the purchase contract. Now, how much earnest money should be put up? is really negotiable between a buyer and a seller. There is no standard rate. There is no standard amount. It could be anything that is negotiated between a buyer and a seller. So it could be $1 and it could be a million dollars. It's all negotiable between the buyer and the seller. So sometimes real estate agents will say, well, you need to at least do $500 or you need to at least do $1,000 or you need to do $5,000 or whatever the case may be. But that's a suggestion based upon what they think needs to happen to incentivize that that seller to take your offer seriously. Now, depending upon what market we're in, if we're in a downward market where things are coming down, then it's more of a buyer's market than a seller's market. So less earnest money is going to be something that you can do. If we're in an appreciating market, you might have to do more earnest money. It's also going to come down to working with off-market or on-market properties. On-market properties being something that's listed on the multiple listing services where there's an agent that's representing them, or off-market where you're directly dealing with a seller. Now, most times when I'm dealing with a seller, my earnest money is going to be pretty insignificant, like $100 or $200 is typically what I'm put for earnest money because they don't have a real estate agent chime in there or saying you need to put more earnest money, you need to put more earnest money, that type of thing in there. Usually happy with that and we can move forward. I do what I say I'm going to do. And uh, if it doesn't work out, then I tell them it doesn't work out and we move on and part as friends. Um, when I'm dealing with a real estate agent, I'm typically having to put up earnest money in uh, a greater amount. Um, typically, I would say between $500 to $1,000 earnest money is what you're going to be talking for properties that are under that $350,000 uh, mark is probably where you're going to be. Now, can the seller come back and say, we need you to put up more earnest money or we'd like you to put up more earnest money? Yes. Um, and you could say no to that or you could follow through and, and agree to those terms and give them more earnest money. The earnest money is goes into an account. Um, if it's with a brokerage firm, it's typically under a brokerage account. It's not their operating account where they make money and do that type of stuff, but it's a separate escrow account where that money actually sits. So that money is there and it sits there until the closing actually occurs and then it gets transferred out. So what happens is, let's say you put up $500 earnest money. Okay, you put up $500 earnest money because you wanna buy this house. When you make your purchase offer, that's my purchase offer, I think it looks really good, how about you? There's a couple of things that you have in this purchase offer in most real estate purchase contracts. Number one, there is a inspection and evaluation deadline. Number two, there is an appraisal contingency. Number three, there is a financing contingency. Um, and then you've got your closing dates. So when I make an offer to this, to Sally or whoever this is, I'm basically saying, hey, I'm gonna close, I'm gonna do my inspections by November 15th. I'm gonna close by November 30th, and I'm gonna have my financing all approved by November 25th, let's say. Those are probably out of order, but I'm giving them how much I'm gonna buy the house for. I'm gonna buy it for $200,000. Buy a house for two hundred thousand dollars. I'm putting five hundred dollars earnest money. Um, I, I'll do all my inspections. Inspections by November fifteenth. My financing will be done by November twenty fifth, and my closing will be done by November thirtieth. Those, so those are the deadlines that I'm giving. Let's say that they Sally says, "Yep, I'm going to accept that offer the way it's written." If not, she could counter back and say, "Oh, I want a little bit more money, and I want this to be November tenth, and that's the negotiations." What happens is the addendum that was signed last is what 
overrides everything. So my initial offer could have been for this, but then she does an addendum. So that's my initial offer. She does an addendum that says, oh no, we want the inspections to be on November uh, 10th and we want the um, we want the price to be 205, okay? So this would be addendum one. This is the purchase contract. Um, whatever is signed last overrides the terms of what was signed previous, right? So I would sign this and then Sally would sign that as a, as a buyer, I would sign it and submit it. And then Sally would sign what's called a counter offer, which the counter offer means all the terms that are here stay the same. Like we're, we're keeping everything the same except for these things. And that's the inspection deadline and the price or whatever she wants to do. These are the only two things that are changing. Then if I go ahead and I accept that, then these terms override everything. Everything in here stays unless they're overridden by that addendum. And this could go addendum one, addendum two, addendum three, addendum four, addendum five, six, seven. This could go as long as you want to. Um, and it's not under contract till all the parties agree and you actually go under contract, which is when the buyer and the seller have agreed to the terms. After the buyer and seller have agreed to the terms, there can also be addendums that happen after there's an inspection or an appraisal or those things where the buyer says, hey, you know what? Um, we got our appraisal back and it was a lot less, so we need to buy the property for less money. So reduce the price to 200 or we're gonna remove ourselves from the contract and we are going to get our earnest money back. So this is where most people make the mistake. With each one of these deadlines, you can get your earnest money back in almost all cases, depending on how the contract's written, but almost all cases, the contracts are written to favor the buyer. And basically it says, hey, if on or before this deadline, you remove yourself from the contract, then the earnest money is returned to the buyer. So basically what you have here is some ticking time bombs. If my inspections and evaluations deadline is November 10th, on or before November 10th, I have to either say, yes, I'm moving forward, or I have to remove myself from the contract and the earnest money gets returned to me as the buyer. Typically, most contracts say by close of business or 5 p.m. on whatever date that is, say November 10th. The same thing with the appraisal. Let's say the appraisal is part of the financing contingency or there may be its own. I have to have the appraisal and the financing done by November 25th. And if I don't have it done by November 25th, on November 26th, there is possibility that I could lose that earnest money if I don't follow through in the purchase. If I follow through in the purchase, that earnest money applies to the purchase price of that 205 that we've been discussing hypothetically here. Um, and that applies, applies to that purchase. Here's where people make some mistakes. Uh, number one, they don't think about these deadlines and you have to live up to these deadlines or you have to remove yourself from the contract. Um, when in doubt, pull out. So you have to remove yourself from the contract before these deadlines and say earnest money goes back to the buyer. If you do that, you will not lose your earnest money. Um, unless the earnest money was made as non-refundable, which I would never do that, especially if you're just getting started. Um, but non-refundable earnest money is just something you've got to be very careful with. Um, so if you do non-refundable earnest money, that earnest money is either going to go to the purchase price or it's going to go to the seller, period. So if you sign a non-refundable earnest money, that money's gone. It may apply to the purchase price or it may go to the seller, but you cannot get that money back no matter what. If you have earnest money that's contingent upon these things, like an inspection, appraisal, finance, contingency, you have a deadline. Once you pass that deadline, then you cannot pull out of the contract because of any of those things and get your earnest money back. Now, every contract's a little different as to what the seller can do. Can they sue you? Can they sue for enforcement? Can they just give you back your earnest money? There's different um, remediations that a seller can actually take if you go past and you don't move forward, then the contract will outline that. Well, I don't even want you to have to worry about that because I wanna make sure that we get it taken care of before we even get to that point, okay? So here's the other mistake that a lot of people make quite frequently. So the one mistake is they do not let's, uh, they do not live by the deadlines. 
Okay, don't live by these deadlines that they set. These are their own deadlines. Now, what happens if you get close to a deadline and you need more time? Well, you either remove yourself from the contract or you do an extension. Maybe it's November 9th and I haven't been able to get the inspector out there. And I go and say, hey, Mr. Seller, I'm sorry. The inspector has been booked up. We need to extend our inspections deadline from November 10th to November 15th so I can get the inspector out there. Um, the seller can say no. If the seller says no, I get my earnest money back, remove myself from the contract, and we part as friends. Um, hopefully, the seller's like, I understand. I understand it's been a while. You've been trying to get somebody out here. Let's go ahead and do that. And they would sign an addendum to state that, which would extend my deadline. I can extend my deadline again if the seller was open to that if I needed to. But you've got to live by these dates. Okay, Whatever dates you put in here, you've got to live by it. Um, the number two mistake that people are making is they may make their earnest money non-refundable. Okay, If you make your earnest money non-refundable, you'll never see the money again. That money will go towards the purchase if you do purchase, or it'll go towards the seller if you don't purchase, but that money is gone. So if you're making non-refundable, then it's non-refundable. I don't recommend that. Um, there are some situations where it might make sense, but you just need to realize you're never getting back that earnest money. It's either, if it's non-refundable, it's applying to the purchase, or it is going to the seller. So that's the other mistake I see a lot of people make. Um, with these deadlines, not living by them, people usually make these way too short and you've got to make them longer than you think they are. And if you're getting close to the deadline, you need to extend it or remove yourself from the contract. So what's happening is if somebody loses their earnest money, it's because they went past their deadline and they didn't extend it. So they were taking the risk on of saying, well, I hope everything works out. Well, that's a choice. You can do that, but you're putting your earnest money at jeopardy if that's the case. Um, I don't think I've ever lost earnest money ever in my entire life. And I've been doing this now for 23 years. Um, I'd have to check with my wife, Hillary, because she'd remember that. But I can't remember a time that I've lost earnest money because I've always had my deadlines. I either extended my deadlines or I um, went forward with a purchase like I was planning on. Okay. The other thing that happens quite frequently with this is how the contract is structured. A lot of real estate investors want to market as a cash purchase. A cash purchase is if you have the money in your bank account for you to pay cash for this deal. If you don't have the money in your bank account, it is not a cash offer. It's actually a financing offer. It is not a cash offer. A cash offer, when you make an offer, they're going to say, well, we want to see a copy of your bank statement that shows you have $210,000 in it. And you're going to say, well, I don't have that. So then they're going to say, well, where's the money coming from? And you're going to say, well, I'm getting a loan on it. Now, here's the differentiator. There's a difference between traditional financing and hard money or private financing. So it's important that the seller knows I'm getting hard money or private financing. I'm not getting a traditional loan like an FHA or conventional or going to a bank because if the property is in need of work, they know that that property will not sell if it has to get an FHA loan or conventional loan or those types of things because it can't qualify for any of those types of loans. But they also know if you are dealing with private or hard money, then it can move fast and that you can buy the property regardless of the condition. So that puts them at ease. But you don't write a cash offer unless you're paying cash for the property personally and it's in your bank account. Otherwise, it's financing. But you want to make sure you put it as financing and that you put that the financing is private financing or hard money. One of the things you want to do is use our proof of funds letter when you're doing that. So you can say, hey, we've got this taken care of. I'm ready to go. All we've got to do is make sure we get the property valued, get the property inspected, uh, get the title work in, make sure we get the hazard insurance, all those things to check out. We move forward for the closing. That's really all there is to this. Now, if you are writing that as a financing, you can put a financing deadline or you can choose not to put a financing deadline. If you don't put a financing deadline, if for some reason the financing doesn't go through, and we won't know if the financing is going to go through until we get the title report, until we get contractor bids, until we've done a full inspection of the property, until we get hazard insurance, like all everything has to align, including making sure the seller's payoff works the way that it's supposed to be, that there's no liens against the property. All that has to happen. So no one will know 100% for sure if this is going to close until a few days before the closing, because all these things have to happen and have to get checked off in order for a closing to actually occur. Um, so I recommend that you do put a financing contingency, especially if you are new. Um, if you're more experienced, you may say, I'm not going to put a financing contingency. What I'm going to do is put an inspections contingency. 
Um, let's talk just for a minute for the inspections. Um, the inspections is typically inspections and evaluations. So with the inspections, it's not just I went through the property. It also can be I evaluated the deal and determined it's not as profitable as a deal as I want, and I'm removing myself from the contract. One of the things that people get hung up on is feeling like they have to give reasons why they're removing themselves from the contract with their inspections and evaluations deadline. That is not necessary. The only reason I would give some reasons why I want to remove myself or is for negotiating purposes. So I may say, hey, this house needs $10,000 more work than I was anticipating. Here's the additional work that needs to be done. Uh, if you lower your price to $195,000, and we will move forward. If not, I'm removing myself from the contract. So that's one approach if it makes sense to negotiate that. And I usually try and negotiate. But let's say it's just so far off where it needs like $50,000 more of work because there's a foundation issue that you found and it's just like this deal just isn't going to work for us. And you won't know that until you go through this process. What you're going to want to do then is say, I remove myself from the contract due to my inspections deadline, earnest money's return to the buyer. And you do not have to give reasons um, because you've had inspections and evaluations for that entire time period. Okay, so let's just do a little recap here. Earnest money is the consideration you put when you make an offer. It's completely negotiable. It's between a buyer and a seller. Secondly, when you make an offer, you have deadlines to live by, inspections and evaluations, closing, financing, appraisal. You need to set those deadlines to something you can realistically live with. And if you need to extend those deadlines, you have to extend it before your deadline's up and you have to get the seller to agree to that and you mutually agree, or you say, give me back my earnest money. Um, and then the earnest money gets returned. Um, we don't wanna make an offer as non-refundable unless we're pretty experienced. Um, that's one thing because if it's non-refundable, you'll never see the money. It's over, the money's gonna go to the purchase or it's gonna go to the seller. It's non-refundable. There is no refund on that. Um, the other mistake that a lot of people make as we talk about this is they make their offer as cash. So we've talked about making sure you're making your offers financing, but you're showing that it's private financing or that it's hard money so that you have these contingencies that are built in place. So this is how you make sure you never lose your earnest money. You make sure that you're moving forward on great properties. It gives you the opportunity to do the due diligence. Now, you may ask yourself, so why does a buyer have all this time to go through a due diligence period? Basically what happens is I walk through a property, I'm there for 15 minutes and I make a $200,000 offer for it. Or in some cases, I've never even seen the property and I make an offer for 200,000. Well, I wanna have the opportunity to get on the roof and look at the foundation. Like I'm buying a $200,000 house. I can't evaluate that in 15 minutes. So it gives me a time period where I can get the essential people in there like contractors, inspectors, or whatever the case is to make sure that I'm getting what I think I'm getting for the 200,000. And if I find out that I'm not getting that, it gives me the opportunity to remove myself from the contract, get my earnest money back and go on and find another deal or I can renegotiate with the seller and go to a purchase price that will work for me or remove myself from the deal and get my earnest money back. You should never ever lose your earnest money unless you put it as non-refundable. And that's really, if you're more of an experienced investor and you know that that money is going to be gone no matter what, but I really don't recommend that unless you are very experienced. So this is everything you need to know about earnest money and deadlines when we're dealing with purchase contracts. I hope this is really helpful for you in knowing what to do as you are writing your offers.